Since the early days of capitalism, theorists, governments, activists, industrialists, society as a whole has attempted to alternately ride its wave or tame it. We've tried to imagine what comes next. Or to paraphrase Frederick Jameson, it's easier for most of us to envision the end of the world before the end of capitalism. But what if we've already moved into a post-capitalism era? This is the concept that we explore in today's interview with renowned academic, economist, author, and political leader, Yanis Varoufakis. It is my great pleasure to welcome economist, political leader, professor, former Greek finance minister, and author of several books, including Technofeudalism, What Killed Capitalism. Yanis Varoufakis, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So I would be remiss before we dig into the book if I didn't ask you to um, to respond to something that you've been advocating for for quite some time, and that is the release of Julian Assange. If I could just get a few words from you on that and the importance of this moment, that would be great. A combination of immense joy that uh, Julian is with Stella, with John, with his kids, that he's free, that he can see the sky after 14 years of not having seen it once. Uh, out of that, uh, you know, of the, the Guantanamo Bay uh, Supermax prison of the United Kingdom, Belmarsh, where I've seen, I've visited him and I left um, just aghast that anybody should be living under those conditions. So overjoyed about that. And at the same time, I have to say that uh, I'm in mourning because um, for the first time in the history of the United States, journalism has been criminalized. That's right. It's been forced, uh, tortured to force, effectively, tortured to confess uh, a guilt which is non-existent. He pleaded guilty to journalism. So, you know, Dan Ellsberg, my other great hero from the 1960s and 70s of Pentagon Papers fame, uh, was never convicted. He never acquired a criminal record despite Richard Nixon's uh, very concerted efforts to have him indicted, to have him condemned, to, to have him plead guilty. So it's a very sad day, a sad week for journalism, for freedom of the press. Uh, but at the same time, this is the bleak times, the dark ages that we live under. It's, in, it's far worse now than uh, it was under uh, the worst president in the history of the United States, <laughs> Richard Nixon. Uh, because now it's not just a rogue president, and uh, it's not just one war, the Vietnam War back then. Now we have a number of wars. We have a war in Ukraine, we have a genocide in Gaza, uh, and indeed we have the whole of Europe, which has been co-opted by NATO, by Washington DC, essentially to turn itself into, uh, um, well, a, a kind of replica of Israel. Uh, a rogue continent uh, planning its future along the lines of a war union. And I think that uh, Julian's uh, appearance in that kangaroo court in the middle of the Pacific is, is greatly symbolic of the deterioration of our political realm over the last 50, 60 years. There's a lot more that uh, obviously we could talk about in terms of Assange and also uh, a lot of the work that you've done and the writings that you've done on the European continent, the nature of the EU. We actually just uh, published um, a piece on kind of the the outcome of the parliamentary elections and kind of what that pretends for the future of, of Europe as a whole. Um, but I really do want to dig into techno feudalism. And first of all, thank you for writing the book, because uh, I found it rather um, not only accessible, but extraordinary at the same time. Well, thank you. Um, and you use a narrative device in this, and you've done this before. It's a narrative device of writing and conversation. So you've written to your daughter about the nature of capitalism before. Uh, and in this one, you're in conversation with your father, who seemed like an extraordinary man. Yes. And it's in the opening chapters, you, in this conversation, you provided perhaps the best explanation of dialectical materialism through the lessons of your father and metallurgy, something that he was quite passionate about. And I was hoping that you would 
set us up today, set the table by giving us your thesis of techno feudalism, uh, but in kind, kind of incorporate those lessons because I really actually found them, uh, again, very accessible, but quite beautiful. Well, thank you for your kind words. Uh, the device of writing a long letter to someone. Uh, I wrote a long letter to my daughter, unbeknownst to her, <laughs> when she was only 12, uh, in order to, you see, um, look, I'm inflicted with a condition. I'm an academic by training. Uh, and the, the, this is my means by which I liberate myself from academic language. So I wrote this as a letter to my 12-year-old daughter, my theory of capitalism, without using the word capitalism, uh, because it was my way of um, ensuring that I prove to myself that I understand what I'm talking about uh, without using jargon, because if you need to use jargon, it means you don't understand what you're talking about. And I did the same thing then, uh, explaining techno feudalism to my dad. Um, okay, so what, what am I actually saying? What I'm saying is this. Uh, firstly, Technology is the most uh, uh, dialectical of uh, artifacts of the human spirit and of the human hand, in the sense that in a purely Shakespearean or ancient Greek tragic way, uh, we are the creators of uh, magnificent artifacts, magnificent instruments, magnificent technologies uh, that can produce a great deal of good and at the same time they can be demonic. So Mary Shelley captured that beautifully in Dr. Frankenstein, this idea that you know, good intentions, brilliant technologies, the human spirit can combine to produce something that uh, can save us even from death uh, or give us uh, an opportunity to uh, liberate our, ourselves from fear, from uh, hunger from being cold or being too hot during the summer and at the same time destroying the planet, destroying everything around us or to put it differently in more modern terms, we have created a technology that are that is putting us in train either to achieve the world of Star Trek, which is a liberal ideal communism uh, or towards the matrix where we become subjugated to the very technologies that we've created. So that's the dialectical tension of our ability, our alienated ability. I think I've heard and you describe it as less Orwell and more Huxley at this yes. point. Indeed, right. indeed. That's that's my, my great fear, that we're not simply being listened into, but instead, as in Brave New World, uh, we are actually being manufactured as happy slaves. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> who don't need, in, in need, even need to be surveyed. So, okay, back to the idea of capitalism and techno-feudalism. Capitalism came out of feudalism. Feudalism was a system of organizing human work and political power, whereby all power emanated from the land, from land ownership, to be precise. So if you were have um, lucky enough to have been born into the landed gentry, uh, you have owned land. You, you couldn't buy it, you never sold it, it was a disgrace to sell it. Uh, and that land ownership essentially gave you ownership of the labor of peasants that happened to occupy the land. Uh, so land produced a surplus which you appropriate it as the owner of land in the form of ground rent. Essentially, you didn't have to work. Uh, you could do all sorts of things like plot to overthrow the king uh, or to invade <laughs> your uh, neighboring lord or baron or earl. But work was not something that you would ever get your hands dirty with. Uh, so land producing ground rent. If you look at the cathedrals of Europe, the magnificent cathedrals, uh, they are the result of a wealth accumulation process, which is essentially a rent accumulation, the accumulation of ground rent by the owners of the land who owned the right to the produce of the peasant labor there. Back then, it is important to remind, especially younger people who take the present world for granted, that back then there was no labor market, there was labor. There was no such thing as a labor market under feudalism in the sense that you worked, 
uh, you produced corn or wheat or whatever it is that you produced. And then at the end of the harvest, uh, the Lord would send the sheriff, would take 60% of the produce, you'll be left with the rest. There's no wage, There is no. you couldn't quit, <laughs> you couldn't be hired. <laughs> so no labor market, no land market, no market for land. Land was either acquired through inheritance or through war, or it was bestowed upon knights and soldiers by the king. No real estate market. Uh, young people need to be reminded of how recent the labor market and, of course, the stock exchange and so on is. So what gave rise to the labor market, to the stock exchange, to capitalism, was a great transformation, as Karl Polanyi put it in that wonderful book of his, a transformation of feudalism to capitalism. Essentially what happened was this. Political power shifted from those who owned the land to those who owned the machines. The machines being the steam engines in the factories, later on the railway systems, the um, electricity grids, the telephone poles, uh, the uh, factory lines, um, you know, Henry Ford's uh, production line, uh, Thomas Edison's uh, networked vertically integrated firm producing everything from uh, the electricity that was generated in his power station all the way to the light bulb. Uh, and as power shifted from those who owned the land to those who owned the machines, or capital, to put it differently, you know, produced means of production. That's what a machine is. It's a produced means of production, whether it's an industrial robot today building cars or a fishing rod. It's something you produce in order to produce something else. So anybody who owned capital became the recipient of profits, which is not the same thing as rent. The fundamental difference. Rent is... Um, a return on uh, the work of others which you can extract courtesy of owning something which is in short supply, like land or you know, oil rights, drilling rights in Alaska or wherever. But the profit is um, the residual, is what is left over from operating in labor markets, in capital markets, in the markets of goods. So, to cut a long story short, we went from feudalism to capitalism with land being replaced with machines, with capital, as the source of power, and wealth accumulation went from being rent accumulation to being profit accumulation based. Uh, and in the context of this great transformation, uh, the market plays the central role. So under feudalism, there were markets. There were always markets. There were markets in Phoenician times, in Roman times, in ancient Greek times, but they were peripheral. If you look at Europe uh, in the 8th, 17th century, early 18th century, uh, the things that were being sold and purchased in marketplaces, the stuff, uh, salt, pepper, uh, clothing, uh, it didn't exceed half a percent of everything that was being produced. Before that, everything was produced within the estates and used within the estates. Mm -hmm. So think of your, your great-grandmother um, knitting a pullover for you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a commodity, a, 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 something that is being produced, but not through the marketplace. Uh, so the market, the you know, profits, and capital became the linchpins of the socio-economic mode of production known as capitalism. What I am saying now is that uh, when we weren't even paying attention in the last 10, 15 years, there's no particular point in time when this happened. During this phase, especially after the great financial collapse of 2008, we have undergone a great transformation of our own. Uh, a second great transformation. And this time, the shift took place from, in the same way that you had a shift from land ownership to capital ownership, now you have a shift from capital ownership to a new form of capital ownership. So what happened was capital 
created a mutation of itself, a bit like you know a, a virus that mutates and produces a new strain, uh, which can be quite different if the mutation is uh, radical. It can be a very different virus to the original one. Uh, we have a new form of capital, which is creating a new socioeconomic mode of production. That's the essence of, of my book. And what is this new capital? I call it cloud capital. It is what lives inside your phone, your laptop, going through the optic fiber cables crisscrossing the bottom of the oceans, uh, the server farms, uh, algorithmic capital, um, all the applications. Um, this uh, highly dialectical relationship that um, this form of um, material capital allows us to have with machinery. So whenever you... Um, you talk to your phone, whether it's Siri or the Google Assistant, Gemini, Alexa, or even you don't even know that you're doing it when you are simply on Amazon.com. You're training this new form of capital, which is completely networked, and it operates on the basis of algorithms that are uh, pseudo-intelligent. I don't call them artificial intelligence, I call them pseudo-intelligent. But nevertheless, you train them to train you to train them to train you to train them, this is the dialectical process, uh, so that they know you so well that they can recommend good songs for you, to, good music for you to listen, good for you, uh, books to read, uh, and all sorts of things which really, really surprise you with how good their advice is. I am surprised constantly by Spotify. When Spotify recommends music to me, I always, I, I never say, oh, this is terrible, this is not the kind of thing I I like sometimes I like it sometimes I love it that's it that's the range of reaction when Spotify recommends music to me similarly with Amazon recommending, recommending books I do think it's no. important to to say um that you are decidedly not anti-technology and that has really come through in your interviews in the book and that's not the thesis here the thesis is is technology has delivered wonders it's kind of the dangers present within it that uh, that you speak to but you're not anti-technology not at all, not, not in the slightest. I'm a techno enthusiast, but at the same time, uh, I'm not stupid. <laughs> well, I try not to be. <laughs> I don't believe that technology will save the world or humanity uh, because, you know, because of my father. My father taught me when I was six in those conversations we had in front of the fireplace when he was showing me how you can convert uh, pig iron into steel through heating it up and baptizing it, that's how he called it, you know, just <laughs> shoving it in cold water and therefore turning it into steel, much, much harder and bending a different chemical composition, composition coming out and how that ushered in the Iron Age. And once the Iron Age was uh, introduced, uh, two things happened. Firstly, uh, history started being counted in the decades, not in the centuries. Mm. In other words, history was sped up because communities, uh, countries, empires that had access to steel-making technologies uh, essentially overwhelmed all the others because their swords were harder. They penetrated the copper, copper steel, um, shields of their opponents. Their plows were tougher so they could produce more produce, more agricultural commodities. Their temples uh, were bigger because they could sustain architectural um constructs uh, like the Parthenon and so on uh, that could never have been, been built using copper. Uh, and at the very same time, my father introduced me to the poetry of the ancients, uh, like Hesiodus, for instance, who lamented the age of iron as an age uh, of people who, couldn't, who didn't have the opportunity to sleep at night because they feared uh, their own power and the immense horrors that could, could be brought upon people by people that had access to that technology. So from the age of six, I was schooled to this dialectical opposition of our technologies being capable of producing the best and the worst simultaneously. And if you think of the ancient myths, uh, this was, you know, it's, it's amazing that the ancients actually understood that so well. Take the myth of Prometheus. This is, uh, for those who've forgotten who he was, he was um, a minor god on Olympus, demigod, who um, 
was a humanist. He actually believed in humanity. He believed that humanity could use technology well. So symbolically, he stole fire from Zeus, you know, the head honcho of the Olympian gods, and brought it down to humans and gave it to us, hoping that we could we would do good things with that. And the result was that you know he was at the Julian Assange of the Olympian period. He was punished uh, uh, for centuries uh, by Zeus for trusting us. And then, of course, the ancients told the story, not so much as oh, what a great demigod Prometheus was, but so sort of self-critically, he gave us fire, fire symbolizing uh, Vulcan, the god of um, steel making of technology. We have technology, and what are we doing, doing with this? We're carrying out the Trojan War. We kill each other. Uh, we mm, enslave one another. At the same time, we create beautiful works of art. We no longer have to live in hunger. Uh, we can b build beautiful homes and palaces and so on. So they understood this dialectical tension of being able to produce the best and the worst. And clearly, the objective is uh, to use technology well, not to destroy technology. The, so, yes, I appreciate technology. I am a, yeah, I can't live without my phone, <laughs> without my smartphone. <laughs> okay. um, and I wouldn't want to live in a world without cloud capital. But the question is, what is cloud capital doing to us? And this book is all about the horrors that are unfolding all over including all the way from, you know, from the death of the liberal individual, the fact that um, our soul is poisoned by apps who are primed to poison our minds and our souls in order to maximize the rents, or cloud rents as I call them, that the tech lords who own, or the cloud elites who own cloud capital, um, extract from us through poisoning our conversation and you know, our anger, our awful behavior to one another uh, on the internet, in Twitter or whatever, uh, essentially creates cloud rents for the owners. Uh, so from that all the way to the new Cold War between the United States and China, which for me is fully explainable by the rise of cloud capital, because you know this, this cloud capital is immensely, immensely powerful. And there are only two countries in the world that have it, the United States and China. And that to me explains not Taiwan, not the EDC about the Chinese becoming too uppity and spying on the Americans as if they, yeah, the last... As if they don't already know. Yeah, as if the Americans <laughs> are not spying on, on you and me every day, you know, yeah. think of it, just NSA, I don't need to say anything more. Um, so my book is all about how do we reclaim the beauties, the wonderful aspects of cloud capital, not how do we destroy cloud capital, but how do we socialize cloud capital in order to reclaim our own minds and our own capacity to be autonomous and free individuals using cloud capital, not having cloud capital turn us into either cloud serfs or cloud, or cloud proletarians. So, uh, our show focuses on issues, it looks at issues through primarily a socioeconomic lens. And so I was thinking about how to approach the balance of this conversation, uh, particularly with an economist far above my pay grade, and thinking about, rather than asking you to kind of regurgitate chapters of your book, because I want everybody to actually go read it, um, maybe indulge me in another dialectical experiment a conversation with other great minds, past and present. And one economist that we quote often on this show is Joseph Schumpeter. Mm -hmm. And so Schumpeter's theory of creative destruction, as you know, is the that, that, that innovation temporarily destroys labor, but then labor itself will evolve in fits of growth to kind of meet the challenge. And in that way, we are changed. So that's the the material dialectic of that relationship through creative destruction. Are we witnessing the, the end of creative destruction at the hands of the algorithm? What would you tell Schumpeter about this moment to either support his thesis or to, to warn of the dangers of it? What I would say uh, to Joseph Schumpeter is uh, that creative destruction continues. 
that hasn't changed. Uh, his theory remains valid. But now there is also another process which uh, wasn't around when he was writing. Because his story applies to the phase of what I call monopoly capitalism or oligopoly capitalism in the first half of the 20th century. And it was remarkable. If you looked at what you know, people like Henry Ford and Westinghouse and Thomas Edison did, uh, the creation of the net network uh, um, company conglomerate, uh, especially in the Japanese uh, or Korean uh, manifestation that also included a large bank attached to the conglomerate. Mm. Uh, if you look at the techno structure, as John Kenneth Galbraith put it in the 1950s and 60s, that emerged in, in, in the United States from the war economy, where essentially you had uh, these large corporations manufacturing the products through a process of creative destruction, but at the same time manufacturing the desire for the products through mm. another process of creative destruction, which was beautifully captured, and I use this quite extensively in my book, by the great series Mad Men, um, where Don Draper, this fictional, um, wonderful advertiser, um, essentially utilizes even nostalgia, even basic human emotions that come out of our collective and private history in order to commodify uh, and package differently anything from a Hershey bar to Bethlehem steel. Mm -hmm. So that would all be and was utterly recognizable to Schumpeter. Uh, the, 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 there is this discussion happening today about artificial intelligence, which leaves me cold and not particularly interested in it, about how many jobs will AI destroy. Um, as Schumpeter will tell you, uh, yes, it destroys a lot of jobs. I mean, all technologies, the, the automobile destroyed millions of jobs. Uh, you know, if, if you were a, ped, a pedal maker for horses, for, you know, horses, shoes, and um, you were in the business of horse rearing, you lost your job. But then you found a, another job as, uh, or maybe not you, maybe your kids, uh, working at a gas station, working at an automobile manufacturer, building highways and so on and so forth. So yes, this is the creative destruction process. And this is what AI does already. Uh, I know young people who are in the business of uh, selling prompts, <laughs> prompts for AI, <laughs> you know, they know what to ask the AI bots so that the AI bot produces what you want from it. Because you, when I ask it, I ask stupid questions. <laughs> my daughter tells me. Um, <laughs> So there is a whole prompt producing um, profession now. So, and, and that was unheard of two years ago, not 20 years ago, but two years ago. So yeah, that's another example of creative destruction. But if I had Joseph Schumpeter here, I would say to him, but Joseph, there is something that was not around during your time. And that is that markets themselves, which Schumpeter considered to be the mechanism by which all this energy and technological prowess is being converted to progress. Markets are destroyed. I would say to Joseph Schumpeter, and you see, I never make this distinction between economics and sociology ever. Anybody who makes that distinction ends up with bad sociology and bad economics. Uh, I would say, um, okay, come here with me, you take your own laptop, I have mine, you go into Amazon.com and you go look for um, uh, some music stand for, you know, to put your music scores on while you're playing the violin or an electric bicycle, whatever. And you, you, I do the same thing. And I will show him that I would get a completely different set of recommendations from the same website uh, than he would. And I would explain to him that the moment we entered Amazon.com, we exited capitalism. We exited the market. This is not a market what we've entered now. And I would also explain that it would be, that it's not simply, we haven't entered a monopoly, because this is how Joseph Subenter would have understood it. It's owned by one man, Jeff Bezos. So it's a monopoly. No, it's not a monopoly. It's a different kind of science fiction space where you don't have a market. 
because in the market, the way Schumpeter understood it, the way you know Marx understood it, the way Adam Smith understood it, the way Hayek understood it, it doesn't matter which political side, which side of the political or ideological political economy fence you are, they all understood markets as decentralized systems. Mm -hmm. the, the whole point about the market is that you know it is not uh, Gosplan. The, you know, the planning agency of the Soviet Union, where some central node um, find, tries to find out what you want, what I want, what uh, the, the, the Communist Party wants, and then tries to find out which factories can produce what, and tries to match uh, needs or demand with supply, with production. Okay, so this the, the, the ghost plan is exact opposite. Planning is the exact opposite of the market. The market is supposed to be spontaneous. Schumpeter would understand this very well. That, 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 that there is a degree of decentralization. It's not fully decentralized because you may have monopolies in there. You can have Thomas Edison being the only one who's producing the electricity in New York City. Uh, but again, it is a market with maybe one seller, but it's still a market. You know, residents of uh, New York City could say to one another, you know what, we hate this guy, Thomas Edison. We're not going to use electricity. We're going to you know, use candles and stuff him. But that's something you can talk about. The moment you, you enter Amazon.com and I enter Amazon.com, we cannot talk to one another. We ask consumers. The only communication which is allowed in Amazon.com is the one mediated by the algorithm. The algorithm matches you with a particular seller uh, me with another seller, and this matching algorithm depends on maximizing the likelihood, the subjective probability estimate of maximizing Jeff Bezos' capacity to extract the rents, cloud rents, because Bezos doesn't produce anything, Amazon doesn't produce anything. There are capitalists who are producing stuff, selling them on Amazon.com, and we consumers, and we do two things as consumers. Firstly, we buy stuff as instructed by the algorithm for the purposes of rent extraction of the owner of the algorithm and at the same time through our own activity on amazon.com reviews that we post uh, likes dislikes whenever we buy something click even perusing and browsing yeah you know, it gets information from us which replenishes amazon's cloud capital that has never happened before this is outside the market this is not a marketplace so i would say joseph Welcome to techno feudalism. You're, now you're out of capitalism, and the reason why he would, I'm sure that somebody like Schumpeter would understand the significance of this, is because the moment you bypass markets and you allow somebody like Jeff Bezos, and Bezos is just one example, there are now countless such cloudalists who own digital fiefdoms that encase, that enclose within the digital space, the digital fiefdom producers and consumers. Uh, Schumpeter would understand that the moment you replace markets with these digital thieves, where the algorithm, think about it, the algorithm, that's what Schumpeter would understand. The right. algorithm is the role of the Soviet cost plan. Right. It is centralizing. It's a central planning system. It knows what everybody wants, what everybody can produce within the system and matches centrally without pre allowing any degree of spontaneity or shopping around or browsing or conversation between producers or consumers or producers and consumers. So it is in a sense, it's the KGB's or the, <laughs> the Soviet <laughs> cost plans, greatest dream. I mean, I know some people who are still alive from that regime and they're kicking themselves that they didn't invent it. The difference is that this is privately owned by somebody like Bezos, who uses this centralized system, which is exactly the opposite of what Schumpeter understood as a marketplace. Exactly the opposite. The precise, diametrically opposed uh, situation. Uh, so that's more or less what I would say to, to Schumpeter. And that has immense repercussions for macroeconomics, because when, when Bezos extracts anything between 10 and 40% of the asking price, this money disappears from the secular flow of income. So you have a reduced, diminished aggregate demand. So either you're going to have a very stagnant economy or the central bank will have to print money to throw into the mix. Right. QE. And that has other repercussions. It enhances inequality, as we know from the last 20 years of our joint experience in the West. Uh, it has the repercussion of um, uh, ending any kind of um, delineation between your private time and your work time. 
uh, every time you are on the internet, especially as a young person, you are curating an identity which one day you will have to sell to one of those cloud lists. Hopefully, when you are trying to get a job with Google or with some startup that wants to sell the startup to Google one day if they go through the process of, uh, uh, of validating their app, let's say. So this really is a major sociological transformation, a great transformation, no lesser than the one that we undertook when we went towards the end of the 18th century from feudalism to capitalism in Britain and then from Britain to Germany, to France, to the United States. Okay, so let's continue then in conversation, but with some of maybe some, some people more contemporary, some of okay. your contemporaries. Um, so it, it, your book got me thinking about the, the convergence of big ideas, mostly on the left, coming out of the global financial crisis, what we were to do with this moment. And as you were sort of championing the anti-austerity movement in Europe at that very moment, we were kind of learning about um, the effects of QE, the effects of what was happening with surplus capital through stock buybacks, the consolidation of wealth and, and the increases in inequality. And so leading into that moment, we had uh, theorists like Sheldon Wolin, who gave us the concept of inverted totalitarianism, where basically we're, we're the corporations are sitting within uh, the the seat that government normally occupies and controlling us, uh, but they're they're nameless and faceless. Esther Duflo writing about developmental economics using data and rigor that we now have access to to try and alleviate poverty. Maybe Thomas Piketty uh, talking about the the changing nature of of capital itself. Uh, and how we have to think about um, capital within the global system. But in each of them, I find a common theme, and that is they're they're all looking for ways and structures and methods to either overcome capitalism or be present when it evolves so that we can get into this, I think this, uh, maybe it's an anachronistic view of, the evolution into socialism. So we're trying to manage this process, but coming out of capitalism and all of it focused on mitigating the negative effects of capitalism, reducing poverty, reducing income inequality. Um, that's the common theme that I see in all of that literature. And then along comes techno feudalism. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of breaking my brain a little bit, um, to be honest, because it you're suggesting, I think, that we've already moved past capitalism and maybe that the normal levers that we have available to us or the ways in which we think about mitigating the negative effects of capitalism may not be up to this present moment. So what do you say when you're probably actually daily in conversation with your colleagues about the way that we have to think about emerging from this moment because we're already in a, in a new reality? You remind me of, um, you know, my my youth, <laughs> the early days of my politicization, where the great uh, debate within progressives was between social democrats who believed in civilizing capitalism and uh, reducing its, you know, reining in its excesses, using the market system to produce value, because it was considered by social democrats to be an efficient system, the market system, but transferring that value, redistributing it using the state in the context of the mixed economy. That's the old social democratic mm -hmm. uh, perspective. And socialists or communists who believed, uh, and I was on that side, full disclosure here, mm -hmm. uh, who believed that uh, capitalism cannot be civilized for long, that it can be civilized like the social democrats did achieve a degree of civility in Sweden, in Austria, even in Germany under Willy Brandt, uh, in Britain for a short period of time, uh, sure. under the Labour Party um, uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but like uh, the great Michal Kalecki, the macroeconomist who was a contemporary of Germany at Keynes, said that even if Keynes in his works, before it completes its work, its job, uh, the ruling class is going to pull the plug. Uh, <laughs> and it will go backwards. As we so saw with the end of Bretton Woods. 
That's right. Where they did precisely that in as an abrupt a way, as you suggest. Uh, so that was Kalecki's point. Uh, and that's why I was on the side of the socialists. But still, I thought it was a very interesting debate, clash between social democrats and socialists. Uh, what cloud capital has done, it has made this conversation uninteresting. <laughs> it was dissolved because, um, uh, and I do have a segment, mm -hmm. one of the chapters, I don't remember which one now, in which after I have uh, dealt with the death of the liberal individual, as I call it, this was my uh, discussion with liberals, for whom I have a, a great deal of time, by the way, uh, telling them that liberalism is finished or was finished by cloud capital. It was initially dealt a major blow by monopoly capital, but now it, it has been finished off by cloud capital. Then the next uh, segment of that chapter is uh, the death of social, social democracy. Mm -hmm. And the point I'm, I'm making in the book, and in my own head, uh, when I, I come to think of it, is this. When I was having this, these discussions in the 1970s with my fellow progressives in Britain, especially when I was cutting my teeth, politically speaking, uh, in the 1970s, it, it, Social democracy was still a possibility because how did it work? You had a social democratic or New Deal in the United States context, president or prime minister. Uh, he, it was usually he, uh, would bring into the White House, into 10 Downing Street, into the chancellery in Germany or in Austria, uh, the representatives, the captains of industry and the trade unionists. And they would sit, they, they would sit them around the table and say, OK, all right, okay, let's cut a deal. Uh, a segment of the surplus value accumulating in the hands of the captains of industry is going to go to the state to fund uh, uh, Medicare for all in the American context or national health services, uh, to fund universities, education, this, that, and the other. And another chunk of their profits is going to go to workers in the form of better wages and better conditions. That was the social democratic deal, and it worked. It worked until it stopped working. <laughs> With the end of Bread and Woods, and uh, the uh, the shift. I mean, what, for me, neoliberalism doesn't mean anything. Is simply it, it is as related to really existing capitalism as Marxism was related to the Soviet Union. In other words, not at all. It's just a, a figment of some people's imagination. It's neither new nor liberal uh, neoliberalism. But that era, which is associated with neoliberalism, so a remarkable transformation on two levels. The first level is power shifted from Western industry to Western finance. So when capitalism was born, power went from the landlords to the owners of capital, the industrialists. And then after the end, the death of Bretton Woods, it shifted from the industrialists to Wall Street to the mm -hmm. city of London, to the Frankfurt banks. And you had deindustrialization in the West. And the factories moved east. Uh, that made social democracy very difficult. Because think of you know, Gerhard Schroeder, who took over from Willy Brandt, the social democratic tradition in Germany. Uh, or uh, Tony Blair in England. Um, or even you know Bill Clinton from from an American perspective. Once the factories have gone, and power is with the with the bankers who are no longer vanilla bankers than like they were under Bretton Woods, where they could do very little stuff because of the Glass Steagall Act, the separation mm -hmm. of gambling from finance and so on. Uh, suddenly, those bankers could mint money themselves uh, to their heart's content. It was as if they had invented their own ATMs and they, they could do anything. You know, all those toxic derivatives and so on, this was like producing money. Uh, what do you do? You bring them into your um, cabinet office and you sit them next to trade unions. You know, these Wall Street bankers have nothing to say to the trade unions and the trade unions have nothing to say to the Wall Street bankers. They don't work for them. So it's, it becomes very difficult, social, social democracy. And what social democrats did, and New Dealers did, Clinton, um, the American version, not, not that Clinton was a New Dealer, but you know what I mean. Mm. <laughs> uh, what they did was essentially, they forgot about the trade unionists, but then they went directly to the horse's mouth, to the Wall Street bankers, to the bankers in Europe, and they, and they cut a deal with them. 
we will allow you to do whatever you want, deregulation, remember, financial deregulation, and in return, you'll give us a few crumbs of your table. Because, but because their table was so full of dough, those crumbs were quite substantial. So they managed to, you know, Tony Blair, Gerhard Schroeder, uh, had a lot of money from the financial sector to invest in hospitals, schools, universities, uh, amenities, uh, unemployment ben benefits, and so on. So that was a form of democracy, but it wasn't a lasting one. It was not sustainable because the moment finance exploded or imploded in 2007-2008, right? Those social democrats were in the pockets of the financiers. So the financiers simply said, now you are going to bail us out. And if you need to impose austerity on the many and socialism for just us, you do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these social democratic leaders... So already by 2008, social democracy was on its deathbed. And then cloud capital comes in. How do you make Jeff Bezos sit around the table with trade unions? <laughs> uh, it is simply impossible. So to cut a long story short, with cloud capital, I think we have a very stark choice. We cannot regulate it. You know, whatever the attempts by the Biden administration or the um, European Union Commission to, you know, good luck to them. But when the owner of the algorithm does not know how the algorithm produces what it produces. When the same people who code open AI cannot tell you why chat GPT four, five, six, whatever gives you the answers it gives you, how can a regulator regulate that bloody machine? It is impossible. But what you can do is socialize the ownership. So I think that uh, the evolution of capitalism to its monopoly phase, to its financial phase after the end of Bretton Woods, and now to what I call techno-feudalism, mm -hmm. has made it very clear for us. Either we abandon any chance of civilizing the world we live in, or we bring into public ownership cloud capital. And by this, I have a very simple example, so as not to complicate things. Um, Uber. I have no problem with the Uber algorithm. It's a great algorithm, but I wish it was owned by the taxi drivers right. and by the local, by the municipality where the taxi drivers operate. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Imagine if it was run by our municipalities on the basis of a commons, uh, an algorithmic cloud capital commons. That would be brilliant. But, you know, that takes a political revolution. You know, in New York, we even financialized the medallions right before Uber came out. They financialized the medallions and people could trade them in an open marketplace. I knew bankers that built an entire portfolio of leveraging medallions right up until the moment that Uber came out. And of course, those medallions became worth nothing and people lost their entire fortunes in that process because we financialized that as well. It seems like we'll just financialize anything we can, anything that proves some sort of value in a limited capacity, we'll get there. Yeah, ex exactly right. So, you know, this, um, I, as I said, when I was young, I was on the side of the socialists against the social democrats, but I could recognize the strong pool and strong arguments of the social democrats. Now they have none. And they've, they've, it's no surprise that they've gone to ground. Where are they? Yeah. Um, even even when they win elections, like you know, Keir Starmer is going probably to, to win the election in the United Kingdom now, and he presents himself as a social democrat, where is the social democratic aspect of his manifesto? I, I spent a very sad afternoon yesterday reading it. There, there's no social democracy in it whatsoever. It's just another Tory um, mm. neoliberal document. We did extensive work on the Clinton era, um, really pinpointing that as as sort of the precipice of neoliberal neoliberalism in action, applied neoliberalism through government theory here, and and how that actually treating every individual as a, as an entrepreneur, and that's where I as we as we end sort of uh, we get to the end of this. I, I want to think about people, and I want to think about labor, and where we all fit in this, because this idea of a uh, of a cloud commons is enticing in the same way that a worker cooperative is enticing, but on a massive scale. You know, if, exactly if, the, the, same thing. if the Mondragons of the world can still exist mm -hmm. and make it through this techno-feudal period, is that a model that we can look forward to? Because we've obviously in this country, in, in the United States, we've 
we've had very little ability to 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 move there's a lot of barriers against it but we've had very little ability to actually create anything of scale like we would see in a mondragon as an example uh but it, are those the images that we are supposed to be looking at now because you're you've done step 1 which i always find to be actually the hardest step and that is to to change the language you have to you have to change the language and the way that we think about things because if we're no longer talking about exchange value and surplus value mm -hmm. and we're no longer talking about monopolies we're talking about something entirely different and that harkens back to feudalism which i think is a really good allegory for us to to talk about that era being applied in the digital age but the the models that can be successful are we talking about those massive cooperative models? Is that what we're supposed to be advocating for? And where is the political alignment with that if, as you say, the social democracy movement is non-existent? Well, thank you for giving me um, an opportunity, <laughs> a leg in, to advertise my previous book because I <laughs> did it the wrong way around. First, I answered your question by writing a science fiction novel. Uh, my previous book was called Another Now. Yes. And it was my attempt to answer your question. Uh, what, what could we have done differently instead of Occupy Wall Street, which fizzled out, uh, instead of the indignados in Spain, which fizzled out, the many here in Greece, which led to our government, but then to our demise? Uh, what could we have done differently? And what kind of political movement would need to go together with a cooperative movement so Modragon can become the, not, not simply an outlier, but the corporate model on which... Uh, uh, technologies and uh, human creativity can build uh, a new society. So I, I answer that in another now. Um, that book came out in the middle of the pandemic, so it didn't receive that much of um, coverage and to, to, to my great discontent. Uh, but let me make the point that uh, there have always been socialist cooperative pockets in the midst of capitalism. Let me remind you of the great uh, experiments by Robert Owen in the 19th century. He built New Harmony. whole communities in the United Kingdom. Whole communities of cooperatives uh, lacking um, uh, you know, a, a, a capitalist uh, power structure. And they, some of them were very successful for a very long time. Indeed, uh, when I was living in England and Thatcher became prime minister, one of the banks that she privatized was the trustee savings bank and it was a 100 year old cooperative bank and it was a very successful one and she hated it with such <laughs> because it was so successful and to, she, she 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 went to such great lengths to eliminate it because it it, it simply captured everything that she loathed so she ordered it to be privatized but then her minions came to her and said but Prime Minister, we cannot privatize it because it doesn't belong to the state. She said, who does it belong to? She said, to every single little human who has a bank account there. She said, what do you mean? Everybody who has an account, even one pound in it, is an owner? Yes, independently of how much money they have. So you know what she did? She ordered them to nationalize it in order to privatize it. I did not know that. Ah, there you are. These wow. are class warriors. Cl real class warriors live on the right, not on the left. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, wow. so the point I'm making is that Modragon and Modragon-like cooperatives are the model. A one person, one worker, one employee, one share, one vote. That's the basic. And you know, I mean, in terms of corporate law, it's really very simple to rewrite corporate law. Say, so, well, shares are not tradable. So they're like ID cards, student cards, when you enroll at college or university. You know, the moment you go to Princeton or, you know, University of Texas, whatever, you get a card. It allows you to do things like vote, like use the library, go to the sports center. And, and then when you leave, you give it, give it back. Um, imagine if shares were like that. Mm. Technically, it's that easy. Politically, it will uh, they will nuke us if we try to, do it. <laughs> but we have to try to do it. If you simply expect modern like cooperatives to grow within capitalism, it's not going to work. Right, because success is their greatest failure. The moment they become successful, then somebody like Thatcher will come and target it, or take it over, or you'll have you know a venture capitalist will come and bribe the members. 
you know, simply say how much do you want in order to sell it to us and stop it from being a cooperative. Yanis, can we close then on the work that you're doing through DM25 and the Progressive International to talk about how to internationalize some of these concepts? Because if I'm not mistaken, it is, I think it still holds true that these cannot be separate and pocketed movements that will always be subject to being crushed by nationalism. And like you, like you say, whenever a bad actor comes into the state. Um, so in what is it that the Progressive International, the work that you're doing with the M25 to kind of rehabilitate the continent that, uh, that you claim is home? Uh, what, what, work, what work are you doing right now uh, that you would like to surface for people to, uh, to look at? When in uh, November 2018, Bernie Sanders and I called for the Progressive International, we did this on the basis that the bankers, the Davos crowd, internationalized. And the fascists internationalize. If you look at the relationship between the Trumpists, Le Pen, the Alternative of Deutschland, Viktor Orban, uh, Prime Minister Modi of, of India, if you look at them, the way they hobnob, there is genuine solidarity and cooperation mm -hmm. and even affection between them. Yeah. If you look at the way bankers associate in Davos, there's no racism. I've seen Nigerian bankers, Swiss bankers, Greek bankers, British bankers, you know, they they are a, a model of solidarity. The only people who have not managed to be solidaristic and to internationalize ourselves are the progressives who supposedly are cosmo cosmopolitan, leftist, socialist, anarcho-syndicalists. So that's the whole point. The point of the Progressive International and DiEM25 in Europe is... Um, uh, to internationalize. So it, the MP5 is a very interesting experiment. It's going on, been going on for seven or eight years with limited success. But the fact that we're still alive and we have some like 165, 170,000 members is, for me, it's, it, 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 it is a vindication. Why? Because this is not a confederacy. We don't have a Greek chapter, an Italian chapter, a German chapter, and a Dutch chapter. We are all in there as, you know, what we call ourselves uh, a bunch of bastards, you know. <laughs> we, we, you know, we are there as Europeans mm -hmm. and non-Europeans too. Whoever wants to be a member becomes a member, and then we elect our collect coordinating team. Uh, and if nobody represents uh, Greece or France, that's fine. We don't have to have one from each country. Right. Uh, this kind of transnational organization, not a kind of federation of national chapters. I think that is the way to go. Uh, and this is how the Progressive International is also working. And one of the things that we do as a Progressive International, and some people may know of the action, but not the, the Progressive International is behind it because we don't advertise it so much. Every Black Friday, you may have noticed the campaign, the international campaign, hashtag make Amazon pay. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a magnificent uh, event and action because it starts in Vietnam. It begins with a strike action in the warehouses of Amazon in Vietnam, then shifts to Bangladesh, India, Germany, uh, New Jersey, and then Seattle as the sun moves. Uh, in order to indicate that the, 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 the clash with cloud capital is international because Amazon is international, bankers are international, fascists are international, and we have to be international as well. The only thing frustrating about what you just said is that you make a stop in New Jersey instead of New York. That's very offensive to me. I don't like that <laughs> at all. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope what you get out of this is that uh, more people download uh, and or buy techno feudalism, get it from bookshop.org, don't get it from Am Amazon. Uh, and selfishly, I hope that you had a good enough time that you've come back. Giannis Varoufakis, thank, thank you, you so for much. the work that you do and thank you for coming on.